Our unison scripture reading is Matthew 21, verses 1 through 11. Matthew 21, verses 1 through 11. When they had come near Jerusalem and had reached Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says to you, you, just say this, the Lord needs them, and he will send them immediately. Then faith took fulfill, which had been spoken through the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Look, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went, and uh, Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put their cloaks on them, and he sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went ahead of them and that followed were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in turmoil, asking, Who is this? The crowds were saying, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. I'd like to invite the children forward for the children's time. Hey, Jeremiah. Welcome. You're going to need a palm. Want to hold that? All right, so today is Palm Sunday, and we just um, heard the story of Jesus coming into Jerusalem, and uh, people met him waving palm branches and saying, Hosanna. And a lot of people think Hosanna is the same as hallelujah. Hosanna means Lord save us. Right, so they're asking. They they thought he was going. They thought he was the Messiah, but they thought they were. He was going to save them from, <laughs> save them from the Roman Empire, save them from the government. Ha ha ha. And um, they uh, so that's so they were saying uh, as they were entering, they were greeting him like a king, and they waved these palm branches. Next week, next Sunday is what? Do you know? next week is Easter. And on Easter, we have Monday, Thursday is when uh, Jesus gets arrested. He has, it's when he has the last supper with the the disciples. And, uh, and so we still celebrate communion, the last supper, um, all the time. And then that's on Thursday and he gets arrested on Friday. He gets crucified, which means he gets uh, killed on a cross. And we have crosses in our uh, in the sanctuary uh, to remind us of, of Jesus' great sacrifice for us. It's also empty because on Easter we celebrate that he rose again, right? I want to teach you something, and you might not be um, able to totally do this right off the bat, but and for those of you who have, have palms and you haven't done it already, here we go. Uh, we're going to make a cross. So um, you can try it if you want to. You don't have to, all right? So you're going to take your palm... My mom taught me how to do this when I was little, and I was like, right? And that's the base of the cross. And then you're going to make the arms by turning it to the side like that. And then you're going to, there's one arm. Is everybody doing this in the pews? I hope so. All right? There's the other arms. And then you take the rest, and you just wrap it around there as best you can. And then you tuck the ends. And of course, this one has two, and so it's going to be fun to do. There's plenty of these, by the way, if you want to do more and practice them. But it's kind of a, a reminder of... I'm being challenged by the tucking. And there are people who do this like an art form. There, I got it. Ha, 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 ha. All right, so that it stays. 
There are prettier ones, but there you go. Right? And uh, this is one of those things I'm teaching you. This is something that my mom taught me when I was little. Um, and uh, it's a good reminder that we go from um, Palm Sunday, where everybody's celebrating Jesus, and the very next week, Jesus um, is dying for us on the cross. Can we say a prayer together? Fold our hands, close our eyes, bow our heads. Uh, dear God, dear Jesus, we celebrate you as king. And we pray, Lord, save us. Uh, this week is very holy. It's when we remember your great sacrifice for us. Lord, help us to honor you this week in our thoughts and in our prayers. And may all our celebrations of who you are and who you are for us give you glory and honor. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our second scripture lesson comes from Psalm 118, verses 1 through 2 and then 19 to 29. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Let Israel say his steadfast love endures forever. Open to me the gates of righteousness that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Save us, we beseech you, O Lord, O Lord, we beseech you, give us success. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God, and he has given us light. Bind the festal procession with branches up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will give thanks to you. You are my God, I will extol you. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. I'd also like to uh, read more from the, the Gospel of Matthew, uh, what we read before. I wanted the kids to be able to hear that, that story. And then it continues. Then Jesus, after he's come into town, Jesus entered the temple and drove out all who were selling and buying in the temple, and he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. He said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. The blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he cured them. But when the chief priests and the scribes saw the amazing things that he did and heard the children crying out in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David, they became, they became angry and said to him, do you hear what these are saying? Jesus said to them, yes. Have you never read out of the mouths of infants and nursing babies you have prepared praise for yourself? He left them, went out of the city to Bethany, and spent the night there. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And let us join our hearts in prayer. Gracious God, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts might be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So as a kid, Palm Sunday was always a favorite. We always sang the palms. You may not know that, uh, because I've learned as an adult and as a pastor that uh, most music directors have a disdain for that song. Um, did, or all the way green palms and blossoms gay. Do you know it? I'm looking at the choir. No, really? Oh, we sang it every year when I was a kid. And when I uh, pastored in Wharton, I told the, the music director when, when she was hired in the, you know, our first Palm Sunday, and I said, will you ever sing the palms? She's like, no. <laughs> no. And, but it was, so I remember walking into the sanctuary and hearing it, and I looked over at her, and she had this plastered-on smile, right, with this, you know, 
looking at me like, I hate this, but I love you. you know? She would play it as the inch for it, but she would never have the choir sing it. Another memory is uh, making the crosses. Uh, my family, my mom always volunteered us. Last year I saw uh, Susan and George in the kitchen pulling the palms apart. Allison, Allison did them this year, and next year we need to plan better, better communication. But um, the, uh, my family was the one that got volunteered, and it seemed like those palms went on forever. Like, you know, you're pulling them, and you're pulling them, and you're pulling them. Uh, but she taught uh, us how to make the crosses. And I, in Wharton one year, I did as the children's sermon taught the kids to make the crosses. And this one young girl, Marissa, who's on the autistic spe- spectrum, loved it. She thought this was the best thing. And every year, and she's in her 20s now, but I know darn well this morning at church, she is there, and she is, will be going around the fellowship hour asking everybody, holding a palm, do you want me to make that a cross? Can I make that a cross for you? And I know also that people who know how to make them will not because they'll wait for Marissa to come and ask them because that's the church being church, and that's a beautiful thing. We say a prayer for whoever that is. Dear Lord, in your mercy. I will bring palms home to my family. And I didn't, my, my husband's tradition, he will put a, a palm in the shape of a cross in his glove compartment. I don't know whether anybody else has that, grew up with that tradition, but I think we're all a little superstitious. And I think it's like a, you know, okay, I'm protected in, in, in my car, you know, I, it's, I, it's funny, I won't knock on wood, you know, because, you know, but I will, but when I want to knock on wood, I cross myself, (laughs) so, you know, we all have our little superstitions. Hosanna in the highest heaven, Lord save us. And you may not, may or may not know this, but the palms from today will be burned, the ones that are left over, and we will use them, uh, the ashes, for the following Ash Wednesday service, and that's That's something that I did not know until I was a pastor. Scholars are now calling Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem street theater. It was a show, and every part had meaning. More on that in a minute. At this time of year, in Jesus' time, When Jews gathered in Jerusalem, they were gathering for the Passover, and it was a tense time for the Romans because, again, it's an occupied territory, and all the the folks who who are gathering have a disdain for Rome. And there's always the fear that there might be a revolt, a revolution, an uprising, a rebellion, a call for liberation. We heard last week that the Jewish religious authorities were afraid of the same thing, that Jesus was being seen as as the Messiah, understood to be a political figure as well as a religious figure. And their fear that there would be an uprising, that Rome was then going to smack down hard and they were going to be decimated. And so they decided to get rid of him, that he should be killed. It continues, I mean, if you just pause and think about it, it continues to astonish you, right? That... Here's Jesus healing people left and right. He has just returned the sight to a blind man. He has just resurrected from somebody from the dead, Lazarus. And the religious authorities, where do they go? Oh, my goodness. He could be the death of us. Let's kill him. It's astonishing. But they were not the only ones who had motive. Rome, too. So on this same day that Jesus enters on a donkey and a cult, and a cult, and let's pause for a second. I don't know if you noticed that. Matthew writes that, that Jesus entered on, on, on a donkey and a cult. How is that possible? And I was listening to somebody. Let's just pause and just, you know, try to imagine that and just recognize that Matthew is trying to satisfy prophecies about Jesus. And so, well, should I put him on, you know, was it, a, was it a donkey or was it a cult? Doesn't matter, just put it both. As Jesus enters town from this direction, 
there's a huge military procession coming in from the other direction with Roman officials and Roman authority. A Roman triumph is a procession after some military conquest. And they come back into town, come back into the city, all, dressed in all of their regalia, with all the spoils of war behind them, with all the people who would then be enslaved because of, of whatever you know, battle that they, that they won. And the people would come out and, and celebrate that. So every year when the Jews would gather for Passover, the Romans planned this military procession to remind people, we're here, we see you, don't forget who we are and who you are, and don't even think about it. So while that's going on, Jesus enters... <laughs> On a, on a donkey and people meet him in the road waving branches and putting their, down their cloaks saying, Lord, save us. Lord, save us. And their Lord, save us was save us from Rome. So, just to be clear, and I, sh and, and I share this, and I'll share this every, every year, everywhere I preach for Palm Sunday, that we need to be clear, because of all the anti-Semitism that has been the history of the Christian church, that Jesus was killed by Rome, that they had a motive to kill him as well, because he was presenting himself as, a Messiah, as the Messiah that would lead the Jews to liberation from, from Rome. Now, I want you to imagine that you were a Jew traveling to Jerusalem, or maybe you live in Jerusalem, and you know about both processions. Which demonstration would you have attended, knowing yourself? And imagine you have kids. What would you have told your kids? Stay home, be safe, don't go see that radical. The children who cried, Hosanna, Lord, save us, how old were they? I've always pictured little kids, but they could have been those idealistic young people who hold up a mirror to the older generations with a question mark. You've just accepted this? How often are the children the ones to push the adults to think differently, to believe in possibility, to not settle for the status quo? Mom and dad, if you don't show up for these things, things will never change. Stand up for Jesus. Show up for Jesus and cry, Hosanna, Lord save us. But Jesus did not come with an army behind him. His conquest was, was different. His kingdom come is still a work in progress. And the ter territory that he chooses to occupy is the human heart and the human mind. I said that each part of the story has meaning. The palms allude to Leviticus 23 and Moses. Matthew, and I have said this as we preach through Matthew, is trying to lift up Jesus as the, the new Moses, the liberator, but the savior of God's people. The cloaks are an allusion to 2 Kings 9. They hurriedly, then hurriedly they took all their cloaks and spread them for him on the bare steps, and they blew the trumpet and proclaimed, Jehu is king. The donkey alludes to Zechariah 9, verse 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter Jerusalem. Lo, your king comes to you, triumphant and victorious is he, humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Hosanna, Lord, save us. So, so far, Jesus has ticked off the religious authorities and Rome. Now it's time to tick off commerce, the merchants at the temple. 
He goes to the temple and disrupts business as usual, turning over the tables. And th- this time for those merchants, it would be Passover when all the Jews are coming in and they need to make sacrifices. And the sacrifices, of course, are animals. And they can't they can't bring them with them because you know they would have rotted, so they need to be fresh. And in order to buy the the, the sacrifices, they have to change their money to, for the temple currency. So it's a money maker for the temple. It's a money maker for the merchants. It's like Black Friday for for the merchants around the temple, and Jesus comes in and disrupts it all. He hits them in the wallet. How do you think they responded? During lockdown, when people couldn't work, some people had no income, and money is security, right? We all wrestle that demon. How did people act? What was their response? Yeah. Anger, Janet said. So who will be on that crowd, in that crowd on Friday? You know, who should we free, Barabbas or or Jesus? There will be disillusioned followers who thought he was going to be the Messiah that was going to liberate them from Rome. There will be fearful clerics, religious types, and there will be angry merchants. Welcome to Holy Week. The passion of Jesus begins today. So what are the modern day implications for us? How is the world crying, Lord, save us, and how are we reacting? What are our children crying out to us? I have recent, had recent conversations about the state of the world and our young people, and I could, I, we could talk about this for hours, but they uh, are bombarded with messages about their mental health. Everybody's concerned about their mental health, and our kids are suffering from anxiety and depression, and it's not just covid They sit in science class, they learn about climate change, and they witness adults unwilling to make sacrifices, unwilling to be cautious, saying things like taking care of the environment is a virtue but not a mandate. And they're fearful for the future because the adults can't get their act together. For all the people who throw the world entitled around like it's candy, We need to look in the mirror. Our children endure active shooter drills. And I am a parent who has been texted by their daughter who was propped up on the toilet seat in the school because she didn't know whether it was real or fake. And we have politicians who send out Christmas cards Christmas cards with assault rifles in their arms, in their kids' arms. That is anathema to the gospel. The Prince of Peace is coming into the world, and the message is that that we want to send out, and we love our guns. Hosanna, Lord, save us. I hear people say, children today, children today are who they are and how they are because of the world that the adults have created. Which possession do we go to? The empire's love of conquest and domination, violence and oppression, or Jesus's rebellion, calling us to love the least of these? And of course, there is the third option, which is just to stay home and sit on our hands and do nothing. Lord, save us. I got choked up several weeks ago at this pulpit because I read a line of a prayer, a Howard Thurman prayer, and the line was, give me peace for my turmoil. And the nerve that was struck was that I was exhausted and here I am calling people to do more and, and do more. And, and, I, and I just was like, oh my gosh, there's so much on my plate. But I'm not feeling that way today. Thank God. But there are days when, Lord have mercy, all I want to do is worry about myself. <laughs> Wouldn't that be?
that be lovely? But that's not a life in faith. Or it is a life in faith, but it's a life in faith when you are not taking the time to refresh and restore and renew yourself so that you can show up for others. Jesus came to institute a new kingdom. And he does not want to be associated with an empire, but he does want to rule on the streets and in our hearts and in our homes. He rules when we love one another as we love ourselves, when we serve the least of these, when we work for justice, when we promote peace, when we are good stewards of God's outstandingly gorgeous creation, when we beat swords into into plowshares, when we value people over money, when we show up for other people, when we listen, and when we are willing to look in the mirror and see the work that needs to be done in us and through us, and we take a deep breath and pray for God's help, and we show up. Today is a day of protest of the status quo and the values of empire. Today is a day that we recognize that we need saving. And today is a day to ask God where we need to be showing up. Now, we can't do everything. You, you cannot do everything, or you will crumble in a little pool of exhaustion. But we all, God is calling us to show up, so we need to do what we need to do so that we can show up. Show up in the name of Jesus, because the world needs us. Our children needs us. Our children need us. And Jesus is calling us. Follow me. And don't forget his promise, I will be with you. In Jesus' name, amen.